<laughs> We're about to get started here. <laughs> Hello? Hello. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Eric Foltz. I'm part of uh, the coordinating committee, and I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Bittner. Uh, Dr. Martin Bittner is an associate professor of internal medicine and of microbiology and immunology at the Creighton University Medical Center and an infectious disease specialist practicing in Omaha. He serves as uh, a chief of infectious diseases and hospital epidemiologist at the VA, uh, Nebraska Western Iowa uh, Healthcare System, and is director of infectious diseases. Fellowship Training Program at the Creighton University School of Medicine. Uh, he himself has traveled to Latin America to, super, to supervise medical students on service trips 17 times. Uh, he has previously served on the board of Global Health Education uh, Consortium. Uh, his background, he uh, graduated with a degree in chemistry from the University of Chicago, went to medical school at Harvard, uh, did his internal medicine training at the University of Michigan, and got his fellowship in infectious diseases from the University of Minnesota. Um, I've had the pleasure to have class with him at the medical school as a second year student, and uh, we're in for a good treat here with his talk on temperate medicine and tropical medicine. Thanks, Eric. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, first, since uh, this derives from some, some of my own experiences, how many of you are in medical school? Okay, and uh, how many of you are in uh, other schools or health professions? Okay, uh, any undergrads here? Okay, and anybody who's uh, made it out of school and is professional? Okay. okay, so we have diversity here. And uh, I'll tell you that this does relate to my, my first experience in tropical medicine. Uh, which involved Creighton's ILAC program in the Dominican Republic. When I went there, I had some expectations. One was political stability. Uh, you may know that the Dominican Republic was ruled by the dictator Rafael Trujillo uh, up till 61. And following a period of turmoil, when I first went to the Dominican Republic, they were about to experience their first ever peaceful transition of power from a democratically elected government of one party to a democratically elected government of the other party in the history of the Dominican Republic. So political stability was one of the things I was told. I was also told that the ILAC clinic saw people with fairly straightforward, simple problems. And being an infectious disease specialist, I had looked up and found that there was malaria in the Dominican Republic, so I had an expectation of seeing some malaria. Those were my expectations of uh, political stability, of um, simple problems, and um, seeing some malaria. Um, turns out, despite the expectations of political stability, the day after we arrived, we got the news that the president of the Dominican Republic had died of gunshot wounds, and remarkable for the epidemiology of deaths of Latin American presidents for gunshot wounds, it was a suicide. First day of clinic, 17-year-old girl came in and died in the clinic of asthma. So much for simple problems. And I didn't see any malaria there or any other of my service trips to Latin America, but I've seen two cases of malaria at the VA hospital in Omaha. So I had expectations, but uh, if you look at this experience with gunshot wounds in Latin American presidents, deaths in the rural Caribbean, we're dealing with things that we often think of in our ordinary experience in temperate climate medicine. Uh, suicide, asthma, and where I see malaria, uh, especially today, today, you wouldn't expect a, a Omaha to be a place where you'd see malaria. And what I realized was that there was a concept of the medicine we practice here in the temperate climate and the medicine that's called tropical medicine. But there's actually, a lot of people recognize there's a lot of overlap. What I'm going to do today is to talk to you, from my perspective as an infectious disease specialist, on some selected areas in infectious disease where there's this 
overlap between temperate medicine and tropical medicine, things that might involve you if you're going to be going from a temperate climate to a tropical climate, things that may, might involve you just being here in Omaha and dealing with some issues that have come to us. And what uh, I'm going to do is to pick out um, a few vaccine-preventable diseases where there are concerns both here and in the tropics, hepatitis B, uh, tetanus and diphtheria and acellular pertussis, the Tdap vaccine, polio, uh, measles. And I'm going to talk about some diseases we thought was tropical diseases which have come to the U.S. And we're talking about chikungunya and dengue. And for um, each one, I'm going to ask <coughs> why is this important in the tropics? Why is this important for us in the U.S.? And what I'm going to emphasize is some of the key recent developments that we've seen. And since a lot of your students, let's have a sports type question. A missionary family on a year's furlough from East Africa. It's a process of missionary family in the patterns. They would spend several years living in East Africa, doing service in a year in Omaha, sort of reacculturating and raising money. Uh, seeks health advice as they plan their return. For whom is hepatitis B vaccine indicated? I want you to look at the answer. A 35-year-old pastor, his 32-year-old wife and nurse, their eight-year-old son who spent his first year of life in Omaha, and the pastor's 60-year-old father, an oral surgeon, who will spend four weeks with them. Okay. How many say the pastor? Okay. How many say the, the wife, the nurse? Okay, have some hands. How many say their eight-year-old son who spent his first year of life in Omaha? Okay. And how about the uh, oral surgeon? Okay. Now, the way we think about this is uh, it turns out that before we had the hepatitis B vaccine, one of the groups with the highest risk of hepatitis B were certain surgeons, particularly oral surgeons, because there was a risk of contact with blood, and sharp objects, and getting cut. And so almost certainly the oral surgeon has gotten the vaccine already. And uh, in a, another perspective, the same is true of the son, because uh, the uh, hepatitis B vaccine is part of the routine series of immunizations, actually starts at birth. Uh, so uh, the son probably is already immune to hepatitis B, as is the nurse. Uh, she, I, I would suspect all the health science students here have either had hepatitis B vaccine on admission or had some test to determine immunity. Can you show of hands how many of you had a test for immunity? Okay. Right. But the pastor is old enough that he may not have gotten hepatitis B as part of the routine series of immunizations. And uh, so he may not be immune. Now, if you think about how hepatitis B spreads, you may wonder, Chris, you know, it spreads through being born to an infected woman. He's already been born. He's over that hurdle. Or it spreads by um, having uh, blood contact. And in his ordinary work, he wouldn't be having blood contact. And he'll probably tell you he's not a injection drug user sharing needles. Or it could spread by having sex with someone. You may say that, oh, I'm a pastor. I only have sex with my wife. I never have sex with anybody else. But um, so, so he may be a little bit reluctant. But there there's actually would be a recommendation that he would get it. And, and it really arises from two issues. Um, the first place is I'll show you, there's a lot more hepatitis B in a number of countries outside the U.S. than inside, and it's so readily transmitted, 100 times as easily as HIV, that there's quite a bit of chance that just some contact that he wouldn't even notice, uh, brushing against something, uh, a micro cut on his skin, he might get it. Or that another factor is that there are a lot more road accidents abroad than in the U.S. He may come across somebody who's bleeding want to help him, and I've heard this, he may have a mission heart, and if he's immune to hepatitis B, that could give him some protection in that case. And, and the reason that this is an important thing to think about is that in this map, the darker the color, the higher the prevalence of hepatitis B. And you see that the U.S. is relatively light, but if you look at East Africa, it's relatively high in prevalence of hepatitis B. So there's a general recommendation for people who are going to spend some time in countries with um, moderate or high prevalence of hepatitis B to get the vaccine. Uh, and the reason that uh, we may not be thinking about it is that since 1991, we've had routine immunization 
for hepatitis B in the U.S., part of our, our routine vaccination series. Uh, originally, we, the U.S. had a very targeted approach where they would say, okay, if you're a healthcare worker with blood exposure, you should get it. And so healthcare workers got it. They also recognized that uh, commercial sex workers were at risk of it or injection drug users. So the original theory of the public health authority was that if a, a pimp came up to a uh, little Jane and said, I, I'd like you uh, to be my uh, prostitute, um, she would say, oh, sorry, Mr. Pimp, I have to wait six months until I complete my hepatitis B immunization series. <laughs> or same thing if um, uh, the uh, drug dealer came up and, uh, and offered little Johnny um, to shoot up some drugs. He'd say, oh, I'm sorry, I have to wait six months. So that did not work out, and that's why we went with our current routine series where we actually start uh, infants uh, at birth because of the risk of acquiring perinatally and it's indicated also for somebody who somehow hasn't gotten the vaccine is under 19 years of age. As I mentioned, there's people who are at sexual risk who are susceptible with a, a partner who's antigen positive or have more than one sex partner in six months come in for evaluation for another sexually transmitted disease or men who have sex with men. Um, it's also indicated for people with blood exposure. This includes injection, injection drug user, or if someone just has a susceptible uh, individual with somebody else with uh, hepatitis B surface antigen in the household that's so readily transmitted, or healthcare workers, public safety workers at risk, and people who may be around blood in stage renal disease and dialysis centers, or, or in those in institutions for the developmentally disabled where there may be some issues. And, in the case of the pastor, travelers to regions with intermediate or high rate of endemic infections and certain diseases, HIV, uh, which is often sexually transmitted, chronic liver disease, where you don't want to get another liver disease. And the CDC's recently added diabetes mellitus, and this is because of healthcare workers who fail to adequately disinfect devices used to measure blood glucose in healthcare settings and thus expose diabetics to risk. And actually, the latest thing that's been added is anybody who asks for it. So if you're running an insurance company and there's a claim for hepatitis B vaccine, a uh, patient asked for it would be an acceptable reason. And the reason is the CDC doesn't want to force people to say, well, I've been married for 40 years to Aunt Mildred, but I'm also uh, going around having sex with John. Uh, anyone who asked for it can get hepatitis B vaccine. So key messages on hepatitis B is it's more prevalent in many tropical regions than it is in the U.S. And it's now indicated for anybody who just asked for it, you're not required to state a risk factor. Now, the next topic, I want you to, to think about a 19-year-old woman who's in the eighth week of her first pregnancy. Her last tetanus vaccine was Tdap, tetanus diphtheria and acellular pertussis, at age 10. When should she get her next tetanus immunization? How many say now? Okay, have some hands. How many say between the 13th and 26th weeks of gestation? Uh, 27th to 36th weeks. Okay. How about two, 10 years after the previous immunization? Okay, so we have a variety of opinions here. And this is an area where there's been a recent change. There used to be a lot of concern with tetanus about giving the vaccine too often. We generally, in general, didn't want to give it more often than every 10 years because we were afraid there would be a local reaction, an arthritis reaction, from too frequent tetanus vaccine. But it seems as if this doesn't occur that much. And there's a lot of concern about giving the vaccine. There are two reasons why we want a pregnant woman to be immune. One is uh, if she has antibodies, her maternal antibodies can prevent her child from getting neonatal tetanus. The second is if she gets the Tdap vaccine with the P, the pertussis, her antibodies can provide some protection for a child against pertussis. And so the recommendation is now between the 27th and 36th week is the ideal time. So that we're thinking not just about the mother, but particularly about the child. And we don't think about maternal and neonatal tetanus very much in the U.S. But this map shows you that some countries shown in green had it in the 21st century, but have been able to get rid of it. But yet there's some countries in red where it's still a problem. So tetanus is something which is a concern in less developed countries, as is pertussis in many countries outside the U.S. In the U.S., we've had remarkable success in reducing the risk of tetanus. This is a log scale, so this continued decline is, is very, very striking. So we've had tremendous success 
yet there are some cases. And I just want to review the recommendations that we make in the U.S. One is, as I said, we actually recommend tetanus vaccine in every pregnancy, regardless of the interval since the last one. And this is a big contrast with the older view that if you give it too often, you'll have an arthritis reaction. And our general um, reluctance to give any vaccines or drugs in pregnancy. Why do they recommend that? It, it, I thought you had pretty long immunity because uh, why would they recommend with every, every pregnancy? Okay, why would they recommend it with every pregnancy, particularly if you have pretty long immunity? That's especially true for tetanus. I think one is that um, if there's some confusion, uh, they can make sure that every woman is immune to tetanus, the tetanus side. I think that the special interest is the pertussis, that we've seen more pertussis lately in the United States. And the, the reasons we've seen more pertussis have to do with a number of factors. They have to do with folks who just don't get their kids immunized, so they're immune. And they, they have to do with the fact that we have um, moved to an acellular pertussis vaccine which may not produce as durable immunity in kids. And so there, there are a number of factors that contribute to the continued circulation of Boratella pertussis, among, particularly among adolescents and adults. In our routine immunization program with pertussis, the kids get the vaccine at age two months, four months, six months. So the very smallest kids are not fully protected. If you have this mixture of small kids that aren't fully protected, and continued circulation of Bordetella pertussis in adolescents and adults. Occasionally, there are these exposures. So one strategy, among others, for dealing with this is if the mother would get the Tdap vaccine in pregnancy, this would uh, increase the probability that she would have antibodies that would then be passed on to the, uh, the child to provide some protection. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, but specifically, though, with tetanus, not the other stuff. With tetanus, yeah. How long do you have immunity? Because I guess that's under the understanding I can, they don't, I mean, my drunks will get 10 in a year. You know, they come in when they get their heads scratched. And yeah. then it's like, how long do you really, because I know in Canada they don't do it here as often as we do. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a very, very long protection. And um, uh, I think there's, there's concern about occasional failures. Um, just to go over the, you know, the routine recommendations in the U.S., uh, which sort of illustrates some of the thinking on that. Um, the, the thought is that they, there's this big classification into wounds other than clean minor, in other words, ones which are contaminated, uh, puncture, avulsion, resulting from some object missiles, crushing burns, or frostbite. Uh, and um, with something like that, if somebody, if you, if you don't know their tetanus history, or they've had less than three doses of absorbed tetanus, then they recommend getting tetanus immune globulin because there's concern that those folks might not be immune, as well as some tetanus vaccine. But as you point out, if they have a history of at least three doses of tetanus vaccine, the basic series, then they would say they don't have to give tetanus immune globulin. There is some concern that um, if the last regular tetanus vaccine was released five years ago, they should get a booster, so they would get a booster. I, I don't know if that's consistent with the way you operate? Yeah, oh yeah, it is. Yeah, this is sort of the standard thing. Uh, and then uh, with um, so-called um, clean um, minor wounds, uh, there's no need for tetanus immune globulin. And again, if the history is, you don't know it, or less than three doses, or, or more than 10 years ago, then you need a vaccine. Um, but if you had three doses and the last dose was in 10 years, you don't need anything. So. Uh, there's a fairly conservative approach to wounds, and uh, by and large, um, the, the general recommendation is get tetanus vaccine every 10 years, but as you point out, uh, the protection is probably pretty long-lasting in many cases. And this is one reason why it's important to be updated on routine immunizations before you go abroad, because tetanus immune globulin may not be readily available in some countries. So key messages on tetanus is that there's been this change where it's now recommended to give the Tdap vaccine um, every pregnancy, preferably 27 to 36 a week. And this ref reflects in part diminished fears of an arthritis reaction from vaccine given too frequently. Okay, um, next question is about um, an 18-year-old student who's planning to spend a year in Ethiopia. 
the student has received all recommended vaccines on time. What advice should be given about polio vaccine? We're giving you a number of choices like the polio of none, the polio is made eradicate from Ethiopia, or these fully vaccinated, or he should get a single intramuscular booster, or it actually may be required. Okay, how many say none, it's eradicated from Ethiopia? Okay, how many say none, he's fully vaccinated? Okay, and how many say single intramuscular booster may be eradicated? Okay, number of hands. How many say immunization may be required? Okay, so you have a diversity of opinion. This is truly a changing area. And what's happened essentially is that the situation with polio, which few years ago we thought was really on the verge of eradication, has deteriorated. And uh, what's, uh, what's happened uh, here is that um, you've got um, 10 countries where wild polio virus is either spreading beyond its borders in red or with wild polio virus detected, sometimes just in the sewage, but not currently exporting. And it had been, we thought polio was limited to Afghanistan, Pakistan, Nigeria, but they've been finding it, wild polio virus, a little bit more often. And this has raised concern about a uh, failure of eradication, indeed a worsening of the situation. And a clue to why we're cons particularly concerned about it in the U.S. is a subtle point in the graph of polio cases in the U.S. And you'll notice here, we basically haven't seen it in years. But that little legend on that last arrow on the right is last indigenous case. And if you think about it, that means there's concern about not indigenous cases, but exported cases. And because of concern about spread, there's actually thought that some countries may be requiring polio vaccine, which hadn't been on, it hadn't been on the recommended list. It actually may start to be required in some settings, which means that you want to document a polio immunization on the yellow card that some of you may have gotten, the International Certificate of Immunization, in the required spaces, where here we have a like yellow fever. So, uh, last year, the CDC pointed out that there had been deterioration in our polio eradication program involving a number of areas in the world, uh, in South Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, the Middle East, with, uh, around uh, Israel and Syria, East Africa, around uh, Somalia and uh, Ethiopia, and West Africa with um, uh, Equatorial Guinea, Cameroon, and Nigeria. And they recommended documenting polio immunizations pre-travel in the international certificate. And I would advise you to check the CDC's website because this is such a fluid situation. Uh, no countries have actually started having requirements, but there is the thought, the World Health Organization suggests that some countries may want to require that some people, when you're leaving a polio exporting country, such as Ethiopia, you may need to show proof that you've had immunization so you wouldn't be exporting polio. So the key uh, messages are for uh, polio that um, uh, there's been deterioration and you need to uh, document the situation. So next question is, a 50-year-old woman is going to China. She reports getting all of her routine shots, but she has no records and no measles history of having the measles disease. What would be the best approach to dealing with measles immunity for her? Okay. Some choices, assuming she's got immunity to measles based on her age, draw a measles IgG titer, I'll give her a measles vaccine, Give her the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Okay. So, um, okay. Uh, how many think we assume immunity based on her age? Okay. How many say we draw a measles IgG titer? Okay, we have some votes. How many say go ahead and give her measles vaccine? Okay, we have some support for that. And how about give her the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine? Okay. All right. Well, work through the answers on that. And the issue is that measles is a very contagious disease. Until we had a vaccine, essentially, everybody got it by the time they were six years old. There were some exceptions. 
some of you may know about a very interesting story in one of the Shetland Islands north of Britain. It was so isolated that once somebody would get measles, sort of go through the island, everybody would be immune, and measles would die out. There's nobody left to infect. And then every now and then a mail ship would arrive at the island with somebody who had measles. And if enough years had passed, if there were enough kids who had been born since the last epidemic who hadn't had it, then possibly they could get it going again and it would just infect everybody. And so they had this period of several decades of heart. They would have these measles epidemics there. But that, that's a highly atypical situation. And ordinarily people, you know, were in contact with others. And so if, you, if you're six years old, you got it. The vaccine became available first in 1963. So you subtract six years from 1963, you get to 1957. And that's the basis for the statement. If you're born before 1957, we assume you're immune to measles because it would be very unusual for you to have made it to 63 to age 6 without getting measles. However, this woman is 50. She was born after 1957. Okay, we could draw a measles immune globulin titer, and that would, you know, see if she was immune to measles. Uh, as, as a practical matter, we probably would because that would mean we'd have to draw some blood from her, send it off for a lab test, wait for a lab test to result get back, and then have to bring her back in. So it makes things a little bit more complicated. Uh, you might say we could just give her the measles vaccine. Uh, the problem is there's no single-dose measles vaccine that's commercially available in the U.S. now. It's available as the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And by and large, it's well tolerated, although some adults will get a bit of arthritis from the rubella component. But that's the best answer to give her the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. And measles is a concern. As you know, it continues to be a problem right here in Omaha in the United States. And you see some countries are even darker, as is China, where there are even more cases. So uh, this is yet another reason why we want people to be up to date on routine immunizations when they're traveling. Um, and this is yet another thing which links uh, temperate medicine and tropics. And, uh, you know, the experience that we're having right now in Omaha with measles indeed reflects a uh, continuation of what was seen last year when the number of measles cases uh, started to take a rise. So some of the things to think about in measles immunity are you're immune if you're born before 57 for the reasons I explained. You're also immune if you have laboratory documentation. So those of you who picked the measles IgG titer, uh, you know, understood one of the ways in which you can show you're immune to measles, or if you've had physician-documented measles. If you had the vaccine, the standards for immunity are you need to have had two doses, not just one, and they have to be at least 30 days apart. And the issue is, I think one of the cases in Blair recently was somebody who had just one immunization, and sometimes kids don't respond to the first dose. So if you have somebody who got their one-year-old vaccine and then is heading on to um, uh, you know, travel uh, to a place where there's measles, um, even if they haven't quite reached the age of four to six where they get the preschool measles shot, there's a recommendation to get it. Um, the vaccine has to be given at age 12 months to have a durable immunity. And originally, people worried about the live measles vaccine. They thought it was too strong, so they were giving with immune globulin, which was weakening and not providing adequate protection. So key message on measles is without immunity, there's a risk of measles in the U.S. and more so in many other regions. And before 1989, we actually had um, a one-dose measles recommendation. And you may wonder, um, why do we switch from one dose, which we thought was adequate with a live vaccine, to two doses? And the, the, the reason is um, shown here. In 1989, there were a number of kids who'd gotten one dose of measles vaccine when they were very small, and then the immunity was wearing off and they were getting atypical measles. And one consequence of this was Siena College made it to the NCAA tournament, and they had games in which there were no fans because the campus was quarantined because of measles. And so there was a big shift to two-dose measles. Any of you who are students at Creighton know that Creighton has very strict policies about vaccinations, especially measles. And Creighton adopted this right away. 
Because you can imagine how Creighton would feel if our basketball team went to the NCAA tournament and there could be no fans in the stands because of measles. So that's how we had to go to the two-dose approach. So next question is, a 28-year-old medicine resident returns from India with several weeks of persistent joint pain following a febrile illness. How might this have been prevented? Give you some choices. Okay. How many say typhoid vaccine? Okay. I got a hand. How many say taking a talcum proguano? Got a hand. Okay. How many say avoid ice and drinks? We got some takers. How many say insect repellent? It to be a little bit more popular. I think you know what we're headed for. And uh, these are all choices that you might think about because there is a risk of typhoid in India. Um, having joint pain would be a, you know, an unusual uh, complication. Um, it might make sense to take a topical proguano to prevent malaria, but joint pain is not a prominent symptom of malaria. Avoiding ice and drinks might be a good idea to avoid a number of enteric illnesses. Uh, and, and actually, there are some that can ultimately produce a reactive arthritis. But the big thought here is chikungunya fever. And uh, that is transmitted by insects, and the way to prevent it is with insect repellent. I want you to pay close attention to the date on this slide, June 17, 1914. And you see that India is involved, and there were a number of cases that had been imported to France and Italy, where chikungunya had gotten a foothold. Okay. But I want you to look at the New World and look at that date, June 17. Now I want you to look at a slide from this month. You can see chikungunya has gotten a foothold in the New World. The countries in green are the countries where there's been reported transmission of chikungunya, and that includes the U.S. because there have been some cases transmitted in Florida. Chikungunya fever is a nonspecific febrile illness. When you have a fever, you can't tell what it is. The, one of the striking things about it is there's sometimes persistent, and I mean weeks to months, joint pain. This can especially involve the hands and feet. There's a three-day, seven-day incubation period. There seems to be an increased risk of severe disease in someone who's acquired it perinatally, someone who's 65 or older, or has chronic uh, uh, diseases like hypertension, diabetes, or heart disease. The insect vectors of chikungunya are two of the Edes mosquitoes, Edes aegypti and Edes albopictus. This is characteristic of a number of um, arthropod-borne diseases that they're adapted to very specific insect vectors. It isn't like insects act like a, like a flying syringe that an insect of whatever type just comes around, bites you, gets a little blood, and just, you know, like a flying syringe lands on the next person and ejects that into the next person. Generally, with arthropod-borne diseases, there's another phase of the disease in the insect where the pathogen has to replicate in the insect. And uh, as a result of it, some insects, for some pathogens, there's a good adaptation and there will be replication. In the case of Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, they are competent hosts for um, the chikungunya virus. Other insects may not be. Aedes aegypti has been known for some time in the New World. Um, it's the one that also transmits yellow fever. Aedes albopictus is a more recent arrival in the New World. It arrived 20, 30 years ago. Um, when some uh, used tires were imported to Texas from Japan. I don't know why they imported used tires. <laughs> this is the approximate uh, distribution of Aedes aegypti in the U.S., mainly in the warmer states, a little bit up on the eastern seaboard. Uh, this, and that's the uh, one we've known for some time. The Asian tiger mosquito, the one that arrived in the tires, uh, a little bit farther north, so you see it makes it to Nebraska City, but not to Lincoln and Omaha doesn't quite make it to Des Moines, but might make it to Tama. Okay, so uh, it's um, they're, they're nearby, and certainly there's potential for more transmission of chikungunya in the U.S., especially since a lot of the population is not immune. Um, this shows you, as of this month, Florida, where there's been documented transmission of chikungunya, and other states where people have sought medical attention and have um, uh, but we picked it up elsewhere. So this is a case 
where the overlap between tropical medicine and temperate medicine is the disease we formerly thought of confined to the tropics is now reaching uh, even cold, snowy place. Okay. Uh, how you diagnose chikungunya? Well, within the uh, first three days of uh, illness, you can do a viral culture. First eight days, you can pick it up with a polymerase chain reaction, first transcriptase polymerase chain reaction for viral riboliquic acid. And later on, the patient will develop the antibodies you can use. There's no vaccine or treatment, just prevention, avoiding insects. Um, you stay in an area with air conditioning and screens. Wear long clothing. You can treat it with permethrin. It's substance you get buzz off clothing. That's what it has. It's sort of like the stuff that's in raid. Uh, empty containers of standing water, like used tires, where these mosquitoes like to breed, or use an insect repellent. DEET is the old standby. More recently, other effective components of insect repellents have been re recognized, including picaridin, oil of lemon eucalyptus, paramethane diolin, and IR3535. But DEET's the one that's most commonly used. Uh, remember, the Edes mosquitoes tend to bite during the daytime, so one strategy would be to stay indoors entirely during the daytime. The Anopheles mosquitoes are transmit malaria, bite in the evenings and nighttime, so to avoid malaria, you stay indoors evenings and nights. So, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so key messages about chikungunya are avoid Edes uh, exposure, and uh, it's uh, something that has fever with subsequent joint pain. You prevent it with insect repellent, especially during the day, because these are day biters. Next question is a 50-year-old man who returns to Puerto Rico with a febrile illness marked by severe bone pain and headache. And how might this have been prevented? Um, how many say, I've given the same answers, how many say typhoid vaccine? A towel comfort bottle. Avoiding ice and drinks. Insect repellent. Okay, that's correct because this is dengue fever. And this is the distribution of dengue, quite widespread through a lot of the tropics, including a number of the Caribbean islands. And uh, this is a situation which has really deteriorated in the past 30, 40 years. There really wasn't dengue hemorrhagic fever in the Americas prior to 1981. But it's gotten a foothold, especially with the mosquitoes present. And more recently, in 2009, local transmission has been reported in Key West, Florida. So again, this is something we may have thought of as tropical disease, which has reached the continental U.S. Clinical differentiation between chikungunya and dengue is difficult because you know they have the same mosquito vectors, same distributions. Occasionally, someone's even co-infected. Now, chikungunya is more likely to have prominent fever. Again, the joint problems, the polyarthralgia and the arthritis, and it may have some rash and a uh, low lymphocyte count. Dengue, on the other hand, is more likely to be seen with neutropenia and thrombocytopenia and bleeding, especially with recurrent dengue, demographic hemorrhagic fever shock and death. Uh, you manage suspected chikungunya the same as dengue. And so one of the recommendations is you use Tylenol acetaminophen rather than aspirin or NSAIDs like um, ibuprofen. And the reason is aspirin and NSAIDs in increase the risk of hemorrhage and death, which is a problem in dengue. So again, uh, the prevention message is exactly the same as for chikungunya. Um, using air conditioning, screens, wearing long clothing tree with permethrin, um, empty containers of standing water, and using insect repellent, especially containing deep. So the uh, key message on dengue are, this resembles chikungunya fever, same vector distribution. Many of the symptoms are the same, although a recurrent episode of dengue may produce dengue hemorrhagic fever. And the recommendation is if you're thinking about possibly dengue to avoid aspirin, and non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. Now, I got to admit, some of what I've told you about may lead you with, to be a, a little bit discouraged because I've, I've talked to you about uh, you know, some situations where things have gotten worse, that instead of polio being on the verge of eradication, there's increased concern, that we have measles where it's a concern right here in Omaha, and that chikungunya and dengue um, look like they're poised to um, uh, cause more problems in the continental U.S. But I want to leave, uh, um, leave you on a note of optimism. And, and this has to do with beers and hotel bills and optimism. And, and, you know, um, when I first came to Creighton in 1981, one of my colleagues in infectious disease, one of the ILAC program in the Dominican Republic just had horrible stories, said, oh, this is an awful thing, you should do it. But then it turns out the next winter, I was with him in a continuing medical education program in Cancun. They, unfortunately, they've tightened up the continuing medical education rules, so this sort of program isn't too common anymore. And 
Uh, we were at this hotel, at this restaurant. We ordered some beer. Now, if you order some beer in a restaurant in, in the U.S., it's going to be brought to you right away because they want you to drink it and order beer and order and drink it and order beer and drink it and so on. There, we waited 15 minutes. The beer didn't appear. This guy was fuming. And then we were checking out of the hotel. There was a little mistake in the bill. Oh, it was it's a major insult. And I start thinking, you know, considering his attitude towards slow service and a little mistake, this colleague of mine does not sound like the most flexible person in the world. Maybe Latin America is just not his region. And for that reason, I, I got interested in the ILAC program and went that first time. Now, I did so with some reluctance because I said, look, I didn't take any Spanish in high school, college. I know amigo, adios, uno, dos, tres, but not too much Spanish beyond that. And besides, you go to these places, uh, Latin America, you're going to get traveler's diarrhea. But I went nonetheless, and I, I found a tremendous experience, and I've, I've gone back on 16 other service trips to Latin America, and uh, in the meantime, I've taken courses in Spanish, learned some Spanish, with a lot of mistakes, and, um, and e even though I had these initial fears, I don't speak Spanish, I'll get traveler's diarrhea. Uh, four years ago, I was in Nicaragua. I got traveler's diarrhea and managed the entire illness in Spanish. Thank you. <laughs> We do have some, a few minutes if you have some questions. Okay, well, we'll be up here if you have some more questions. Thank you. Thank you.